If anybody out there knows where Jamie is or he's giving him food, please just get in touch with the police. Everybody's waiting for him to come home. In 1997, the Lavis family were living on Buckley Street in Manchester, England. Eight-year-old Jamie Aaron Lavis was the middle child and had four siblings. He was a cheeky, mischievous and adventurous young boy. At just four feet tall, he was fairly tiny for his age, and his mother Karen said she had to dress him in clothes made for five to six-year-olds. He and his siblings used to play out in the streets together, as did a lot of children in the neighbourhood. But Jamie was afraid of the dark and never stayed out late, making sure he was always back for dinner. Bank holiday weekend, May 5th, 5pm. The Lavis family were ready to sit down for their evening meal, but little Jamie hadn't come home from playing outside that day. His parents thought he had just lost track of time, or maybe he had gone to a friend's house. But as 8pm came and went, and he still wasn't home, his family headed out onto the streets to look for him. They searched for hours, but had no luck. And eventually, late that evening, they phoned the police. What followed was the biggest investigation in Manchester since the infamous Moore's murders. Appeals were being broadcast and everyone was out searching for Jamie. His family were begging for his safe return, and many tips and alleged sightings started to come in. If anybody out there knows where Jamie is or he's giving him food, please just get in touch with the police. Everybody's waiting for him to come home. Now, Jamie's described as being small for his age. He's about four foot tall, and he wears, he wears clothes that are made to fit a five to six year old. Several people said they had seen Jamie catching the 219 bus at around 10.30am the morning he was last seen. Apparently, he had planned on going to buy his mum a birthday present. Following the sightings of him on the bus, Jamie's sister was approached by a man who said he'd seen someone he thought could be Jamie. The man said he wouldn't happen to be wearing a dark blue Reebok tracksuit, would he? His sister Jane confirmed that he had been. 28-year-old Darren Vickers was a local bus driver who lived just three streets away from the Lavis family. He told the family and later the police the boy he now knew to be Jamie had spent virtually all day on his 219 bus. He said Jamie had bought a day saver ticket and spent several hours riding around and looking out of the window before Darren dropped him off near his home. Over the coming days and weeks, with still no sign of the missing Jamie, Bus driver Darren was becoming extremely close to the Lavis family. Everyone was frantic and desperate for answers, and it seemed that Darren Vickers was more than willing and able to help them. There's somebody out there has got to be sick for keeping a child of that age. You know, it shouldn't be done. If they had any respect, they'd just hand him over to the nearest police station. Just let the child go in. Just let him come home. He's not in trouble. He's not nothing. He's just wanted. He started acting almost as the unofficial spokesperson for the family, conducting press conferences and speaking on their behalf when they couldn't face the media. One officer described him as being like the kingpin of the family. I feel he's still alive. I don't fear the same way the police fear that he's murdered. His family don't. Somebody somewhere knows where Jamie is. They saw him as a pillar of strength, and he was fighting alongside them to help find Jamie and bring him home. Darren offered to take part in a reconstruction of Jamie's last known movements in the bus station, along with Jamie's brother and his father. But his fixation with the family and the case was starting to be seen as odd and strange. The more he started to insert himself into the family's world, the more the police were questioning, why? Even the community was starting to wonder why this random man was so deeply invested. As more time passed, the police started to find his relationship with the Lavis family not only troubling, but downright damaging to the investigation. Sharing facts and updates with the family had become almost impossible, because the information would always get back to Darren. 
One inspector said that Darren had become so involved with the family, the Lavises trusted him more than they did the police. More witnesses on the 219 bus that day were now coming forward, and they were giving a totally different account of the bus journey. Darren's description of Jamie as just another passenger couldn't be further from the truth. Jamie was described as turning the bus into a playground, changing the gears of the bus and giving out tickets to people while standing in the driver's cabin. Terrible. Could never dream of it. A young child on the bus like that, you know, just going missing. It's just unbearable to think about. It's just a nightmare for everyone. It's like any child uh, that has a day saver ticket which you board with. Uh, it's up to them what they do with it. They paid for the ticket. They can do really what they please with it. Darren had previously said that Jamie had an all-day bus ticket, but this also added more doubt and raised more questions. Children weren't allowed to buy day saver tickets, and the police started to wonder whether Jamie even had a ticket at all. What the police did know for sure was that Darren was the last known person that admitted to seeing Jamie that day. Police went back to the place where it had all started, the bus station. Hours and hours of footage were analysed from May 5th, and sure enough, there was Jamie. But the footage also showed Darren Vickers. He could be seen approaching Jamie, ruffling his hair and talking to him for several minutes. Again, this account was very different from what Darren had told the police. At the time Jamie went missing, Darren had only been a bus driver for a mere matter of days. Further investigation into his background led police to look into his work references. All the contacts he had put down were fake, apart from one who turned out to be a convicted paedophile. Three weeks after Jamie was reported missing, on the 24th of May, officers brought Darren in for questioning. The Lavis family were appalled that he could even be considered a person of interest, let alone a suspect. This was a man they had let into their home, and someone that was spending every waking moment helping them look for their missing boy. Karen, Jamie's mother, said they assumed that the police had drawn a blank and arrested Darren on a whim. We just got close, it's like one big close family now because we've been out, we've been out basically 24 hours a day, all of us involved looking for Jamie. At this point, Darren Vickers was well and truly considered a member of the family, and although the police had their suspicions, they couldn't charge him based on that alone. They needed more, and they had to let him go. The Lavis family waited outside the station for him, and threw a party when he was allowed home. They were all so upset and angry at the implication that he could have been involved. Darren invited a film crew round to the family home to help clear his name. I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis, and I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, everybody. After his house was searched, Darren even moved in with the Lavis family. He then asked Jamie's parents if they would be godparents to the baby he was about to have with his partner. In July, Darren, who was still frequently courting the media, phoned up the local radio station. Well, I was coming back from Manchester and I said to him that uh, I'm going to have to start you back off now because this is my last run up. Jamie turned around and said to me, but my mum and dad's not in, I've got nowhere to go. And then I said to him, well, since I only live on the corner from me, I can take you back to the depot and drop you off when I go home. But he was over the moon about it. He said, yeah. I said, are you sure you're going to be OK? He said, yeah. That was the last we saw of him. So how's the police investigation going, Darren? The police are not letting much information out about that. It's the family is supposed to know, you know the first confirmed sighting. Yeah. We've never been told. I'll never know till the day he comes home. Mm. I still believe he's alive. If the case was what the police are making out to be, if the case was he was dead, round where they're looking, they'd have found him, you know. Numerous listeners started calling in to quiz him on his version of events. Everyone agreed something was very off. As the summer drew to a close, police were now convinced that Jamie Lavis was dead and that Darren Vickers was behind it. But because Darren was so ingratiated with the family, sharing these thoughts with the Lavises proved impossible and police had to keep their cards close to their chest. 
Thanks to some outstanding driving offences, Darren was arrested and jailed for 10 weeks. This kept him away from the family for a short time while the police moved on with their investigation, trying to find more holes in Darren's stories. On the 14th of October, detectives finally felt they had enough circumstantial evidence to arrest Darren Vickers with the abduction of Jamie, but they still didn't have enough to issue a charge of murder. Jamie's family now had no choice but to accept the reality of what had happened. Darren's fixation with being on or in the media had ultimately tripped him up even more. Some teenagers had recognised his face from the news and went straight to the police with some disturbing stories to tell. They said Darren had tried to lead them into some woods late one night. One of the boys said that Darren had shown him a picture of young Jamie and then pointed ahead saying, I think that's him. Darren started walking away and the teen quickly turned and ran. It was also later revealed that Darren had taken Jamie's older brother, 11-year-old John, into some woods and given him a cigarette. He said to John that this was where his brother was and if he didn't behave himself, this was where he would end up too. Jamie's sister recalled that he had started showing an unusual interest in John, buying him shoes and a new bike, but he didn't seem to care much for the other children. Following all of these accounts, police began an extensive and meticulous search of the wooded area. In the same location the teens described, half a mile away from the path, officers found some tarpaulin, which were covering some clothes, clothes that matched what Jamie had been wearing on the day he had disappeared. The clothes were taken back to the station, and as they were all laid out to be forensically examined, police found a small jawbone wrapped up in the clothing. More human remains were found scattered throughout the woods, but most of the bones were never found. DNA testing of some milk teeth confirmed these were the remains of Jamie Lavis. Due to decomposition, the cause of death could not be officially determined. Darren was arrested and charged with the abduction and murder of Jamie. Police believe that at the end of his shift that day, Darren took Jamie into the woods in his own car, where he sexually assaulted, killed and dismembered him. He then set about involving himself with the Lavis family, partly to keep the suspicion off himself, and partly because he had a morbid fascination with the case. He even started to use a scanner to monitor police radio calls and would turn up at places where Jamie was reported to have been sighted. Darren pled not guilty and a seven-week trial ensued. During the trial, Darren made the shocking claim that Jamie's father had been the one to kill his own son. He alleged that he and Karen had been having an affair and she was carrying his child. Karen was forced to take a blood test to prove the baby wasn't his. Darren Vickers' twisted manipulation of the Lavis family and the media seemingly knew no bounds. Two years since the story broke about the missing Jamie, at Manchester Crown Court, Darren Vickers was unanimously found guilty. Mr Justice Forbes praised the police and also the teens that had come forward with their stories about Darren. The judge awarded them £150 each from public funds. After the guilty verdict came in, Darren asked to talk to Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Rainford, who had been heading the investigation from the start. He finally admitted to abducting, sexually abusing and murdering Jamie. However, just days later he contacted the media and retracted this confession. Darren Vickers was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. He was eligible for parole five years into his sentence, but the police worked hard to ensure that this was denied. It is said that Darren has since gone on to brag about the heinous crime to fellow inmates in jail, detailing the abuse and murder. Roy Rainford believes that the day he was taken into custody, they had stopped a serial killer in the making. In 2014, Darren Vickers was attacked in prison with a hammer, suffering three skull fractures and broken bones in his hand. The Lavis family talk about Jamie every day and his siblings make sure that their children know everything about their uncle. Photos of Jamie cover the walls of the home and Karen said she feels his presence every day.